this work? Hello? Okay, we're good. I'm used to preaching in prison, so. Feels familiar, huh? <laughs> Make do. Except I trust none of you came just to get out of your cell. <laughs> but this okay? Maybe we might have. <laughs> yeah, might have. Well, nowadays that's true. What a blessing that worship was, amen? Amen. What a, thank you, God. They, uh, they accommodated me, by the way. They, I asked them for that song to be the last song before the message. Because I think, in all honesty, the Bible speaks a lot about fear. But the bottom line is the distinction that the Bible makes between fear of man and fear of God is a very great distinction. And that song, I think, just that one line, I'm no longer a slave to fear because I'm a child of God. Do you see the difference? That we, as children of God, we should be set free from fear of man, from fear of circumstances. That's what the Bible teaches. It, it, all the times that Jesus said, do not be afraid. All the times that God said, don't fear. He spoke to our lives, didn't he? He spoke to our situation. In fact, he probably spoke to today in our country. And, and I look at our country. Bill and I have talked about this many times. and About the fear that seems rampant in our land. Fear of a virus. Now, I understand that there's a lot of us don't know much about viruses. Maybe Paul does, but most of us don't. And, and the bottom line is that it, when it first started, it was probably fearful for many people. But as a child of God, as, as a, a Christian that, that trusts in a sovereign God, how can I say that my life is in the hands of a sovereign God and fear what goes on in this world? That doesn't make sense, does it, for a, for a Christian to be that way? The, the Bible's very clear. And I think, uh, I don't usually use notes in prison, but I need to be able to get offended if I didn't use notes. So <laughs> He's always got his iPad, but I don't carry an iPad. So, But we all know, don't we, that, that 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Listen to me. A spirit of fear comes from the world, doesn't it? It comes from our flesh. When you and I, hey, come on, we're all guilty. When you and I get afraid of something, whether it's the unknown, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's our parole date, whatever it might be, when we find ourselves fearful of something, we need to stop and say, God, I know that's not from you. You didn't, you didn't bring that. That fear is from my own flesh, and God, forgive me, I need to get right with you because you gave me a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a sound mind, a sound mind that doesn't run rampant. Our country's running rampant, isn't it? All this crazy stuff that's going on, which has nothing to do with a cop killing a black man. Nothing at all to do with that. Tearing down statues and looting buildings and, and burning down our history makes absolutely no sense. But that's not my concern. God, Jesus warned us, didn't he, what the world would be like. We were warned well in advance that the world would get worse and worse. What concerns me is the Church of Jesus Christ in America. The Church of Jesus Christ in America that has become somewhat, don't be afraid, somewhat feminized, somewhat afraid of the future, somewhat, if you've ever read the book of, I'll get the message in a minute, but it, this is all introduction, okay? I don't know how much time I have, but we'll be, we'll be out by five. <laughs> when I see the church, you know, how are we going to go out on the streets of Crestline or Twin Peaks where we live or, or somewhere else and tell them about a Jesus that sets us free a Jesus that gives us power over sin. A Jesus that died for us. We go out with that message. How are we going to convince people that that's true if they see us living in fear? Come on. 
Amen. Would you? Wouldn't you say, I don't need your Jesus? If you're as much afraid of the world as I am, what, what good is your Jesus for me? <laughs> is that true? You, you see, as people of God, we have to believe that we do have a sovereign God, that he's still on the throne. That he didn't, this didn't take him by surprise, did it? I don't think so. And in Proverbs 29, it says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. You see the difference between the, the, the snare of the enemy and the security of our lives in Jesus Christ. If there's, only, if there's any one thing I could ever try to convince a Christian of is this. Your God is sovereign. Have we forgotten what sovereign means? It means God's in charge. God's in charge of everything. God knows your tomorrow. God knows what's going to happen. God knows if you're going to lose your job tomorrow. Well, most of us don't have jobs, probably, working around this group, but <laughs> we did once, amen? But, but the bottom line is that I have to believe that God knows what's going to happen in my life tomorrow. And I don't have to worry about what's going to be in my life tomorrow. I have to live for Jesus Christ today. I have to have a, a testimony today. One of my favorite verses is found in Revelation 12, 11. i got to make sure I don't run out of time here. I don't get to the song. Well, I am never invited back. <laughs> Revelation 12, 11 says this. And they overcame him. Satan. I use this in prison a lot. They overcame him. People that have drug addictions. People that have all these problems in life. That, that we think our life's all messed up and things are going wrong. It says, and they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb. If you're here today and you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, that cleansed you. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And I, and I would tell you the same thing I tell guys in prison. That's not all your bad years and all the drugs you used and all the bad stuff. That's not your testimony. Your testimony started the day you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And our testimony is what God has done in my life as a Christian. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they loved not their lives to the death. Look at the first, first century church. Look well, at the price that they paid. Look at the founders of America, the price that they paid to give us the freedom that we have. How many of us cling to life when we know our last breath here, our next breath is a whole lot better. Our next breath is with the Lord. And it's so much better. But how many of us fear it's going to happen to us. Fear. Fear of virus. I'm, I'm convinced. <laughs> I don't have to say this lightly because Bill chases me all the time. I work in the coffee shop and he always says, get your mask on, get your mask on. <laughs> Drives me nuts. But, <laughs> Johnny, cut that out, will you? Uh, <laughs> but the bottom line is this. Do you believe that there's an appointed time that you're going to die? That's what the Bible says. It is appointed unto man once to die. There's a point in time. You ain't going out one minute sooner or one minute later. You're going to check out exactly when God says, come on home. I'm ready for you now. Come on home. And so as, if we believe in a sovereign God, we have to believe that our life is in his hands. I want to... Uh, I won't get as much time as I get in prison. I, I want to share. I, I, let me just share this briefly then. Because I'm talking about the fear of man. And we're going to get the fear of God. But the fear of man. I, I love this story because I like to teach you a story. In Mark chapter 4, you remember the story. Is, as Jesus says to his disciples, as he gets in the boat, let's go to the other side. And so they start out and the water is nice and the wind's not too bad and everything's going well. And they start out on the boat, don't they? And what's Jesus doing? He goes to sleep. He goes to sleep in the back of the boat. And then the waves come up. And the wind comes up. And the storm gets worse and worse as they're trying to get across that water. And what do they do? They go and they wake Jesus up. You know what they say to Jesus? Don't you care about us? Are you serious? How many people in the church today are going through problems in their homes, problems on their jobs, problems in their life, and they're saying, God, did you forget me here? Don't you care about me anymore? Don't you see what they're doing to me? And they wake Jesus up. 
You know what Jesus says? He says this. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Do you see what Jesus is saying to them? In those two simple sentences? He's making a contrast, isn't he? A contrast between fear and faith. I submit to you that fear is the absence of faith in our lives. When I begin to fear, it's because I don't trust God. I, God, I, I don't trust you in this circumstance. I, I'm afraid that this is going to happen to me. I'm afraid that this is going to take place. I, I, I want to tell you today, I am totally convinced that doubt and fear are the total opposite of trust and faith in Jesus Christ. In our lives, when we begin to fear, when we begin to doubt, we're not walking in the Spirit of God. He doesn't produce that. He produces in us victory over sin, victory over bondage, victory over the things of this life. And, and, and my sovereign God, your sovereign God knows, doesn't he? Exactly what's going on in your life. I, 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 gotta get there. I, I think of this, one of, another verse I happen to like real well. As Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, you remember the story, and, and Pontius Pilate was challenging him about being a king because Jesus doesn't look much like a king, does he? As he stands before Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate says, Don't you know that I have the power to give you life or death? Remember that? Pontius Pilate says, I have power over you. Don't you know that I have the power to let you go free or to kill you? And Jesus' response was, should be the response of every person in this room today. You could have no power over me unless it was given you from heaven above. Do you understand that I go to an abortion clinic every Friday morning and stand outside on the sidewalk as they cuss us out and do all kinds of things. But I say to myself as I hold that terrible sign, you can do nothing to me but what my God allows. Nothing. No power. Because God has the power in our lives. This verse I'm going to read. Luke 12, 4 and 5 it says this. Jesus speaking. And I say to you, my friends, do, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. I, I, I think that's what Jesus is saying is, we need to strengthen our lives. You know, we've... I better open up... <laughs> I'm going to Psalm 46. Because I, I do need to teach these verses, but let me just say this first. I think Jesus is saying to you and me today, in the midst of chaos, you know, press A and burning down. So maybe we watch it on TV or we see it on Fox News and we see the buildings burning and the statues toppling and we walk out in Crestline and it's all, we're, we're blessed to live in the mountains. They're not burning down Crestline. Not burning down Twin Peaks, Lake Arrowhead. Yeah. 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 But I think what God what Jesus is saying to us in that verse is very simple. Trust him. I think he's saying this to you today. I think he's saying it to me. Some of us have issues, some has doubts. You might be here today with doubts or fears. And I, I tell you today, God's calling you out to trust him. Just trust him with your circumstances. In Psalm 46. In Psalm 46, verse 1, it says this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though mountains shake with its swelling. We are in the refuge of God. That's what he's saying. I think the choices that you and I have in this life are two choices. I don't want to be too bold in saying this, but I say to everybody, either Jesus Christ is the God of your life or you are. 
The only choice is we have. When I wrest control away from God, when I decide I'm going to run my own life, I'm going to, I'm going to worry about tomorrow, I'm going to take care of this, I'm going to take care of that. What I'm saying to Jesus Christ is I trust me a whole lot more than I trust you. Let's be honest. That's what it says. I trust me to fix my problems more than I trust you. I, I, as I looked at that word refuge, you know, refuge is used a lot in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. But refuge is used a lot. Of, it, it paints a picture for us. And I remember when my, when my wife and I moved up to the mountains many years ago. And I looked at the mountains as our refuge. All our ministries down the hill and all everything that we do is down the hill. But it's worth that hour driving back up, isn't it? It's worth the hour getting just to get here and have a peaceful serenity of the trees, the beautiful areas and stuff, and, and a whole lot less traffic, generally. <laughs> Holiday weekend, but normally a whole lot less traffic. But it's nice. But that can become our refuge, can it? It can become our hideaway up on the mountain. And, and God says, I'm your refuge. I'm your refuge no matter where you're at. I'm your refuge down in the middle of Watts or L.A. I'm your refuge in, in, in Minneapolis. I'm your refuge in spite of the things going on around you. I'm your refuge. I'm your hiding place. I'm your place of security and, and, and peacefulness. God is our refuge and our strength. You know, I, I, I searched out that word uh, refuge and I only found one place in the whole New Testament that's used. I want to read it to you. It's in Hebrews 6. It says this. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of, anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast. The writer of Hebrews recognized that that refuge is our anchor, the anchor of our soul, the, the, the promise that God has made to us to be our refuge, our place, our strength, strong consolation, it says. It, God is our strength. When you and I falter, Come on. I'm not the only one that falters. I've spoken for about 16 amens, but okay. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. When you and I falter, as we do, we have to look to the strength of Almighty God. He knows. Some of us, I think some, I'm convinced sometimes some of us are just too embarrassed to tell God, I'm afraid. Too embarrassed to tell God, God, I slipped, I fell, I did this or I did that. But you know what? He knows, doesn't he? It's amazing. I think of the things that I, that I try to hide from my wife. Oh, I didn't say that. The things my wife tries to hide from me. <laughs> Sometimes there's things in our life that we'd be embarrassed about, aren't there? For other people to know. And yet we don't seem to be embarrassed for God to know. Because he sees everything. He is our refuge. Actually, I like the way the psalmist put this. A very present help in time of trouble. A very present. God's not, aren't you glad we don't have a God that's a God afar off? That's a God very near to each one of us. I, don't ask me to explain that because I don't understand it. Eight, eight billion people in the world, I do not understand how God can hear all those voices. But I know the Bible teaches that's true. And I know that when I go home this afternoon, he'll be in my home. When you go home, he'll be in your home. You know, maybe some of yourself, I don't know. But he'll be with you because he's a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, I love therefore. What's that mean? Because he is such a refuge, because he is our strength, because he's our help in time of trouble, therefore I will not fear. We will not fear. Though the mountains be thrown into the sea and, and a whole earth shake, though they burn down the areas all around us, Though the virus gets worse and worse and more contagious and, and threatens, we will not fear because our God controls mountains. Our God controls hills. When I told you that story about Jesus being in the boat, aren't you amazed that 
when they woke him up and he spoke to the sea, it just calmed right down. He spoke to the wind and it stopped. Well, who, who caused the storm? They, they looked at Jesus and said, we are amazed that even the wind and the sea obey you. Hello? They obeyed him to begin with, didn't they? You know, I, I, I better step up. I better step over here and say this. I get in trouble with the pulpit sometimes. <laughs> People don't understand that a sovereign God can cause problems in our life for our own good. Do you understand that? We think the devil does everything bad. The devil cost me my job. The devil cost me this. Listen to me. God loves us so much that he's willing to meddle in our lives if necessary to drive us back to our knees. Amen. Sometimes we stand too tall. Sometimes our own pride is our own worst enemy. And God's not above doing whatever is necessary. If it's your job that you've taken too much pride in, God can take that away, can he? Hello? Hello? If that, that beautiful brand new car we put too much pride in, God can put a scratch right down the side. You know, he can. Trust me. He can deal with it. Why? Because he's our very present help. He loves us so much. I don't have time to go through all these things I wrote down. But I'm going to close with this as far as the part of the message. This is one of my favorite verses. It seems like I got a lot of favorite verses on. Huh? This is one of my favorite verses. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus said this. Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our rest is in God's refuge. The, the world caves in all around us in spite of everything that goes on. Our rest must be in God. We can't look for rest in this world. We can't look for rest in our bank accounts. We can't look for rest in our fancy home. Our rest must come. Jesus said this, come to me when I'm given an altar call, which is rare. But when I give an altar call, I, I don't like a Jersey playing a nice gentle tune on the organ and a sweet thing and these guys singing an old Maranatha song and, and calling people to the altar and stuff. The bottom line is when Jesus gave an altar call, he said this, you, come, follow me. You know, one way or the other, everybody in this room today is following somebody, aren't we? We're either following the person in the mirror or we're following Jesus. Jesus says, if you want to be in my refuge, if you want to know my rest, if, if you want my strength to prevail in your life, come to me. I'm, I'm able to take your burdens. I'm able to take your, your heavy laden things. I'm able to take the things in your life that are holding you back from serving me. The way Malachi ends the Old Testament, he says this, God says, and they will be my jewels on the day that I make them my sons and daughters. And you will discern between the righteous, between the wicked, between he who serves me and he who does not. I submit to you, God forbid, we have many wicked that attend our churches. I'm not saying this church, I haven't been here long enough to say that. <laughs> but much of our chairs and our pews are filled in our churches by wicked people. You say, oh, John, are they murderers? Are they child molesters? No, I didn't say that. I said God's formula is very simple. He who serves me is righteous. And he who does not serve me is wicked. I ask you today, are you living in God's refuge? Is he the strength of your life? Is your, if, if you looked at your life, I don't know you, you don't know me. If you looked at your life, would you say, my life is a pleasing service to God? We can do that at work, can't we? We can do that on the job. We can do that driving. Or oh, driving is a little difficult. Let's try something else. We, get, we can do something, right? But we must serve God. A righteous person serves his God. And the wicked, do not. Don't get mad at me. And if you want to write emails to Bill, that's okay. But I just told you what God said. That's not my opinion. That's what God says.
Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. God, what a beautiful day in these mountains you've created. And God, as we, we come to prepare our hearts, Lord, to take communion, Lord Jesus, to remember what you've done for us. As you gave your, your body on that cross for us, as you poured out your blood for our forgiveness. God, we, I pray for each one of us. We prepare our hearts uh, to commune with you. God, to come into your presence this day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Uh, I'll ask you all to just kind of hold on to this, and, and uh, they're going to play a, a communion song, and then I'm going to come up and share a couple verses, and then we'll take communion, okay? God bless you. Thank you.